interested in uh, make you to work uh, uh, as hard as possible, <laughs> I, I hope you can enjoy uh, Pamplona as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank Mucho you. gusto. And uh, work for us is a holiday, especially when afterward we go and have pinchos and uh, vino tinto and wonderful conversation in half in English, half in Spanish. Well, actually, 45% in Spanish and 5% in Norwegian. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, we would like to talk just a little about. Can I introduce the people you know? I, I think that would be great. Yeah, so this is Ruth Brees from our uh, discussion analysis project. And Damas with Kirgo, so he's a finishing PhD student. That's why he has that face of concentration you know, <laughs> in the final stages of his PhD. And and I, I you know, you usually mm, introduce or, you know the, the speakers, but I suppose that Francis Dean and Mark Keller really don't need an introduction, and they're eager to speak. So I will just just let them. Thank you. And. You can forget our names. It's just the content of um, what we're talking about that might be interesting. Except that there is one practical purpose for remembering my name, Mark Turner. And that is because if you direct your browser to markturner.org, all of your questions will be answered. <laughs> the solution to everything is at markturner.org. How to get to Red Hen where all of the presentations are, the recordings, and so on. Mass, you don't have to write anything down. Just go to markturner.org, and it, it will even take you to Francis Steen. Right? So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a very efficient, my name is a very efficient metonymy for some things that are interesting. Um, now, we want to move directly to things that you might do. As you know, we're all interested in mind and brain, and multimodal communication and how human beings operate. Uh, and I have worked in these fields for many decades. And in the early days, of course, the data that we used were um, small little uh, assemblies of things that we have encountered. So for my dissertation, I got certain kinds of expressions and I wrote them down on three by five, three inch by five inch note cards. And they came from literature and from uh, poems I had remembered and maybe from concordances and from things I heard people say. And I kept these in big wooden boxes that I built myself. It was wonderful, it was a good experience. I still have these wooden boxes there in the basement of my house. And I look at them with happiness because the patient and attentive uh, curating of examples is something we love. It gives meaning to our lives and much of our cultural heritage comes from this. So we will never replace this. We will never supplant this. But it limits us in certain ways. The data is, for starters, almost always just textual. Not even speech, it's just written. And writing is a very nice thing, but it isn't speech, it isn't gesture, it, you hear no prosody, no suprasegmentals, you get no use of material affordances in the environment, graphs, music, in other words, all the things that you would see in a cathedral, which are orchestrated for movement and architecture and timing and pacing and the sound of singing and the images and the interaction, all these things that are so important for human attention and communication have not really been available except by adventitious encounter. <coughs> so there, when logarithms were invented in astronomy, um, a famous astronomer said that the invention of logarithms multiplied the lifetime of the astronomer by a factor of 10. 
because now you could add instead of multiplying, and you made many fewer errors when you were adding instead of multiplying. So instead of working for two years and realize you made a multiplication error two years ago and you had to go back and correct two years of work, you could use a better tool. And when I was in my 20s, 30s, working in these fields, I thought, well, I'm seeing that in the hard sciences, they are using computational and statistical tools to make the work of the scholar easier. But we don't mostly have that in the social sciences and the humanities. Corpora have been invented since then, the British National Corpus, the Corpus of Contemporary America, the Russian National Corpus. And some of these even include a little bit of speech, like the Santa Barbara Corpus, and a few gestures. But mostly, it's not multimodal. Mostly, it's textual. Mostly, it's just what happened to be in the library or the newspaper. So could we have, for the social sciences and humanity, and for cultural heritage, could we have big data with computational and statistical resources? Now, I had known Francis Steen for a long time. And I visited him with my family at UCLA because we know him. And he had taken on a new project. And I won't describe that project except to say, while I was looking at this project and we had a conversation, that was the birth of the idea of Red Hen, where we could get big data for the study of multimodal communication. And Red Hen now has something like 250,000 hours of recorded data. We take it from broadcast television news, but news includes things like interviews, Larry King Live. It includes, uh, what is this wonderful name of this? Ant Farm. Ant Farm, right, exactly, the Ant Farm, right? Now that's news. News for us in the United States is anything where people are talking about current events and what's going on. And luckily, under Section 108 of the U.S. Copyright Act, libraries and archives can record audiovisual news from anywhere and store it and loan it for purposes of research. We can't make it public to the world and we can't compete with the news agencies, but we can use it for research. In the United States, this is regarded as part of civil discourse, as part of information in a democracy, right? So we do that. Now, what can you do with this? Well, the best thing is, the beginning thing, was that we can separate the closed captions, the teletext where you have for people who are deaf, or these days, if you're in the sports gym and it's very noisy and it's playing music, but you want to watch the news, you have closed captions, teletext. Or you're in the bar, and, or you're in the airport lounge, or you're in the lobby of the hotel. Right? Mostly now, uh, the Pew Center reports, people do not watch news by sitting in front of a television. They watch it on their iPods and their iPads and their iPhones and their smartphones and their computers and every place else. Uh, it, the back of a taxi in New York has the news playing right there while you're rolling around, right? So, the first start was to get the closed captions and to be able to search them using the vast computational resources that have been built up in Linux, Unix, um, Darwin, which is the mock Unix shell that is the basis of Mac OS X. And we can do all that. So let me give you, as a beginning example, I just taught a course. I'm jumping straight to real time now. I just taught a course on construction grammar. And I had undergraduate students and graduate students, and they do different kinds of work. And a construction is a form meaning pair. And one way to think about what it means to know a language is to know a relational network of form meaning pairs and how to combine them. Now some of these form meaning pairs will be words, like dog, but others will be clausal forms, like noun phrase, verb phrase, noun phrase, prepositional phrase, which is a cause motion construction in English and French for I threw the spear over the fence, but also he floated the boat to me, right? So all of these things can be thought of as constructions. What's a construction and how to combine them? So I, had, I have very bright students at my university and they're very motivated, but many of them had no introduction to this. 
and I explain to them the theory, but then I give them red hemp, where we have all of this data. And for example, here is a Chinese student from China who was in this course, and he got interested in a Latin construction, an ablative absolute. An ablative absolute is where you take two nouns, like Cristobal and leader, and you put them both into the ablative <coughs> case. And so Cristobal marked ablative, leader marked ablative, no verb, no preposition, nothing. That means with you as leader, and then you can say with you as leader we will succeed. No, that's an ablative absolute. He has a book which I loaned him on absolutive constructions, and because in English we translate so much Latin and did for so long, uh, we have imitation absolutive constructions. And one of these, which he finally found, was absent. So I can say, this project, absent good leadership, will not succeed. Right? Absent excellent diplomacy, we have no hope. Right? He was, so he's interested in this absent construction, but he didn't know how to find it. So I wanted to save all of these students from getting those three by five note cards and collecting them in the big boxes. By the way, when I was done getting all that data, I typed it into a Lawrence Livermore laboratory mainframe, which they use for national defense. But I was a systems operator on this thing doing some work, and my dissertation was done partly uh, on that, that mainframe. Well, he could go into uh, Red Hen and instantaneously, with something like this query, which runs through a utility we have called CQP Web, this says, I want either a comma or a period, followed by a space, any number of spaces, followed by the word absent, followed by any number of adjectives, including zero followed by any number of nouns, but at least one, followed by a comma or a period, and do it you know, in English for these years. Right? Instantaneously, this is a difficult construction to find in speech, instantaneously he found hundreds of hits. And they are things like this. Um, the, uh, so, the level, I think people in Iraq, well, no, let's go back to this one. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had hurricanes that were disruptive. Absent hurricanes, you know, we won't have any problem. Absent hurricanes, I am optimistic, right? So here, he got all absent law, absent them finding the body somewhere, absent provocation. But he also could, got, what preceded it, and what followed it, and a grammatical parse of the parts of speech and the grammatical structure, and where it came from, at what time, and if you just click on this link, it takes you to the moment in the television when someone said that. So you can see the gestures, you can hear the prosody. So he wrote a paper, this is a student who had no understanding of construction grammar or really linguistics before we started. This is probably going to become a paper. My graduate students will work with this undergraduate and he'll probably publish it, right? Similarly, uh, I had, let's go over here, a student who noticed, this will be a little arcane uh, for you, but I had a student who noticed that there are, there's a difference in, uh, so let's say, view, zoom, uh, 75%? Okay, yeah. So I had a student who also, I'm picking out the ones actually who didn't know anything to give you an idea of how easy this is. I had a student who noticed, or I said in class, Oh, could you say that sentence again? And she said, um, well, I, I told him to get off of the couch. So I asked the other students in the room, what did she say? And most of them did not repeat it properly. They would say, 
she said, I told him to get off the couch. Now, you probably heard it, right? But I ex explained to them in linguistics, you have to develop a second head and listen, really listen to what other people are saying and what you are saying, because you will accommodate what somebody else is saying to your own approved construction patterns. She said, what, what? I said, no, no, don't be defensive. All languages are equally grammatical. She had assumed that off of is the way everybody says it. She came from a certain part of the United States. And of course, I, then I went through and I said, you notice 80% of them did, said that you, they didn't say off of, they said off. They said that you said, get off the couch. So we talked for about 15 minutes about the difference between get off of and get off. And what the difference in meaning might be, are they in free variation, just you can say either one, or it's a regional difference. Uh, so we had her go into Red Hen, find lots of examples of people saying off of, lots of people saying off for the same verbs. What are the verbs where it's most common to use the of? It happens to be cut. Cut the banana stalk off of the tree, right? That's much more common than uh, get. This, and at the end, she realized she could say things like, he is inside of the house. He is inside of the house. For her, the of was a container, and that the of was in particular asking for a construction of an image schema, so something's going to go from a source to a goal on a cat. Now, these are not our best researchers. The point is, I just did this, and I could give you 15 more. And these are people who started with nothing. And the real step here, of course, is that they're in a group where they can study. But they can get the data extremely quickly. Now, I won't go to the trouble here, because I think you've probably seen it, of showing you that when you get one of these hits, you can put it into the statistics, or when you get a, a packet of hits that's exported into a comma-separated value file, you can put it into R, you can do the visualization of the frequency, you can separate by verbs, you can correlate with gesture, you can do various things, you, you can see the person actually uh, performing it. But I could show you some of those things, and maybe I'll show you one, and just, I'll just show you one to kind of maintain interest, and then I'll go back to Spanish. So let's see, what have I got here? Let's take this one. And let's see if I'm looking at this. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll do two things, just two things here. So when I was at a conference in Osnabrück, there was a famous construction grammarian who gave a presentation on the construction. How adjective is that? How cool is that? How wonderful is that? How high is that? So while he was speaking, I, or at the end of it, I noticed that he had about 20 examples. While he was speaking, I searched Red Hen for how adjective is that, or is, was, were, be, being, be, because you can just say be as the lemma, right? So it's very slick. And um, I, I got, you know, 1,500 hits just looking at a year. But I said, okay, I asked Red Hen, Give me an example where somebody says how adjective is that, and the same phrase appears on the screen, because we can search optical character recognition for what appears on the screen. So the way you do this is by uh, just a command like this, which looks a little like Martian. Uh, but this isn't CQP web. This is only sort of the top level weird stuff. We have very gentle things that I'll show you in just a second. But what it comes up with is something like, in fact, I'm going to need to plug this in, and we're not. And you'll see. Engagement, George Clooney blessed to have his congrats, saying, quote, how great is that? I'm really happy for Brad and Angie and their whole family. So it's not that we care that much about George Clooney and uh, um, Angelina Jolie, but in a second, you can find an example where somebody says it, it's in the closed captions, and it appears on the screen. So these are the kinds of things that we can do. And if you wanted to look at gestures, for example, let's find Reba McIntyre here. We will only take just a little second 
we have, you know, we have gigabytes and gigabytes of data, which will kind of be an indication to you of uh, how this all works. Coach speech gesture uh, from, from, from yeah, here we go, right here. I'll show you. The time yesterday. No, they've seen them no, 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 they've seen them many times. Okay, now. Seen them now time. Okay, so but good. Here, he's going to ask, how long did it take for the entire thing? He does it with his left hand, of course, because the audience is here. How long did it take for the entire process from inception, he does this coronally, to completion? But he doesn't just do a sagittal timeline. He folds up his hand, says to completion, and offers it to her, so it's a discourse management gesture, and then puts his fist here. Very, very sophisticated. With the whole thing together. And notice he even looks at the inception to completion. You can watch it as many times as you like. Now, you've probably seen a fair amount of that, but what I want to indicate is this morning, you know, how hard is all this, right? What's the, what's the story? This morning, I, look, notice I've got the link for Bar, bar Gaucho, so I can get there and have pinchos, right? Um, let's go right here to, Red him, and I'll say, where did where did I where did I put this? Yeah, how, now this is under how to install. I just did this this morning. So it doesn't matter what kind of computer you have. You don't need to have Red Hen or, or big uh, big servers. Uh, so I'm going to wait for just a second for a wonderful wonderful. Perfect timing, no perfect timing because I was saying I wanted to show you what you can do in five minutes. So this morning, on this computer, not using Red Hen, not connecting by a terminal, not doing anything with our sophisticated software, I in, in five minutes uh, installed Python on this computer. You go to python.org. This is available on the web. Go to markturner.org. What's my name? Mark Turner Donner. And you click on Red Hen, and we'll take you there. And this is under, uh, this is under uh, how to install Python and pattern on a laptop. It's right here, and you can find it. So, it's under tutorials. Well, you visit python.org, and you install the latest version of the Python 2.7 on your laptop. Now, that's a wait a minute. He says install. Is this? No, it means you click the button. You, you click a button that says install, and it installs. It's just a package. It installs, and then you have it on your Windows, on your Linux, on your Mac. Just you click the button, and then it's installed. And then you go to the Clips website, and here's a link, and where it says install pattern. You, you click install pattern, and it downloads and it installs. You don't have to do anything. These are automatic packages. And now, there are lots of tutorials there, but I just wanted to convince people that, for example, you could parse a sentence for parts of speech. It's just a little tutorial in English. So what you do is you say, Python 2.6, and then it opens Python. And then you say, from pattern.english, import parse, which means I want to be able to parse. And here's the sentence. This entire installation of Python and pattern and the parsing of an English sentence and a Spanish sentence was done from scratch on a MacBook Air over weak hotel Wi-Fi in an interval of five minutes. So that's the sentence I gave him. And then I said, I want you to do this. And the reason I said that is I just copy pasted it from the pattern tutorials. If you want to do this, do this. Okay. And print the sentence. And of course, it marks it. Now, you're going to say, oh, wow, that looks like Martian. But there's a thing called the print, the pin tree of tags. And it will tell you, you know, that this is a uh, verb phrase in the past. Here's a preposition. It will tell you how it, it takes a little bit of time to be able to learn this. Now, of course, the important thing is you don't really want to learn this. You want something else that understands these tags to be able to sort it out for you. And, in fact, CQP Web can do that and so on. Now, here's one in Spanish. So, remember, five minutes. I said, okay. Put me in Python, which I had already installed, 
And, okay, I'm in Python. Now, from pattern.es, that's Spanish, of course, import parse. And here's a sentence. In la primavera del año 1829, el autor de esta obra, que había venido a España atraído por la curiosidad, hizo un viaje desde Sevilla a Granada, acompañado de un amigo, miembro, miembro de la embajada rusa en Madrid. That, if that sounds like Mexican, it's because I grew up in San Diego. It sounds like bad Mexican, but that's not here. So you say, okay, parse this sentence, and it does, and then it does the same thing. Now, five minutes, you can get grammatical parsing. What this means is, and of course you could do this, you can do this on one sentence. You can do this on 100,000 sentences. The computer doesn't care. It's all the same. And it will export them in a certain kind of way. So now you could say that I want the following kind of phrase that's got this word followed by this kind of noun phrase. You're not looking for a particular kind of word. So you have seen some of what Red Hymn can do. And Francis now, uh, Professor Steen, is going to explain to you a little bit about some of our new tricks and the kinds of collaborations we're looking for and the kinds of people who are uh, in the network. Francis. Can I add a little, a little you may here. Here. remember to stand here. Uh, this means that somebody wanted to study a very large text, to introduce large text, have it parsed very, very quickly, and then you could perform searches, it's not a method, you could perform searches in that long text uh, for grammatical or syntactic patterns. You could take all of the famous Castilian literature from a certain period. I don't think that this is really for to show there. Well, you know, things would need to be developed. And interestingly, if you wanted to go back to uh, Juan Ruiz and the Libro de Guaynamor, you might have to put in some more interesting constructional patterns, but that's the kind of research we care about. But probably from, you know, I mean, this could do more from the 19th century. From the 19th century, century on, you could do 100,000 texts and tell it, I want to find this kind of thing, and out they would come. And you wouldn't have to sit there and study it. It would even come out in a form that you could put into a statistical package. Now, none of this is going to substitute for the intelligence of the human being and understanding what kind of hypotheses are worthwhile in your relationship to art. But it will save you from spending six months making all those three by five cards to find a bunch of examples. In fact, for the kind of construction my dissertation was written on. Once we had this, I was in Oslo in 2011, and I asked Red Hen to find that kind of construction when I went to dinner. In fact, I went to dinner, I was going to go to dinner, then I came back and looked at the screen to see if it was actually running. It was finished. And it had 100,000 kits for my form. Right? That donkey work to find data is something that should be in the past of people in the humanities and social sciences. And this is true for cultural heritage of paintings, of literary texts, and so on. And that, uh, at that point, I will hit the source button and hope that we have our source. And this also means that you don't need to access a specialized purpose. So is there some university that has prepared a corpus and we can just ingest it and those and that is parsed? No, it's quite now easy to up. get these texts, any text Good. you want in text format. Well now that since there, I'm running the, the camera I can just point it at you. Very Do you have any questions? Do you have questions before we go on? By the way, Francis and Mark can be interrupted. They, they love to answer questions and have comments. Yeah, we, don't, we didn't really need to, to make this uh, a long lecture, right? So especially since we're uh, such a small group. So uh, we were trying to, you know, on the one hand, present aspects of the project that you may not have seen before, but we also wanted to specifically target it towards tools that you might be interested in using yourselves. So um, the... Um, 
the natural language processing tools, the so-called NLP tools that Mark started demonstrating are um, the product of, uh, uh, of a large ecosystem of uh, computer scientists and computational linguists, uh, um, statisticians, and uh, working all over the world uh, uh, to develop the underlying engines. We don't need to understand how the engines work exactly, uh, but we can contribute to improving them, uh, but we can simply deploy them. And um, one of the uh, 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 one of the collections of these tools that are very useful for novices has been produced by uh, the University of Antwerp, uh, the Eclipse project. And um, um, as Mark uh, demonstrated, you can just download the programming language Python, which is a free open source uh, package. Uh, you can install it on any computer. You can install Pattern, which is uh, this particular project. And um, then you can just follow the instructions. So let me just do that live. And by the way, what Mark demonstrated to you was literally done this afternoon. He had never done this before. Okay? So this actually took him, literally took him five minutes to get from nothing to actually parsing text. Um, if, we, if we take something like um, the, the pattern tool has a singularize and pluralize function. You can copy that line, you can simply paste it into <coughs> your Python prompt. Let me take you even further back if we, if we quit here. And, um, sorry, I didn't do that right. Um, if we start with, uh, uh, in, um, on a Mac computer, this program is called Terminal. So uh, you can simply look under uh, Applications, and it's a program called Terminal. On a Windows computer, uh, there are various things you can... Yeah, well, what I have... Uh, is Putty, I think, P-U-T-T-Y. P-U-T-T-Y is one. Yeah. It's P -U -T 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 -Y. the old-fashioned way of speaking to, to a computer. It, I think. Yeah. yeah, you may have to download that. Yeah, download P-U-T-T-Y, yeah. it's a free program. And it basically gives you what, um, what is known as a, as a terminal, or a virtual terminal. And um, uh, that gives you direct access to uh, commands. So for instance, if you want to start the programming language Python, you just type. Can, can you increase the font size if you hold down shift? Yeah, right. You can, you can just type Python. And um, that uh, actually, let me, yeah, OK, so I get it at the bottom here. Now. It's OK. And um, um, this is called a prompt. Doesn't look like very much, a little blinking thing with these three uh, chevrons. Uh, but if you follow the instructions and just copy this after having installed Python and Pattern, uh, what, what this tells the programming language to do is to pick a particular set of functions from the Pattern package and make it active. So here it simply says, actually this isn't working well because we need to see the new lines. So let me get it back to... Um, let's see if we can... I think it's probably buried if you change the size of the window. I think the screen is below the projection area, and so if you could, uh -huh. if you could change yeah. the size There's of the window. Combination of. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, let me just uh, disconnect so that I get my window back. There you go. So we did do this in five minutes this morning, but we didn't rehearse doing it in five <laughs> minutes while we're projecting from the sky. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, let's try again. Yeah, I'll have to find the right source. Okay. You good? Yeah, there you go. That's what I'm doing. And then if you can increase the font. Let's try here, and then let's try. So I'll just read this. He types Python. And, and then I just paste in 
this um, this little script that he got from the pattern website. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, I uh, just want it clear. There, there let's try go. that. But there we go. Now I actually am up. And then let's see if I can blow it up a little bit. That's okay. Okay. So, um, so, so this is again. It's called the prompt. You you type in a command, and um, it calls in a library of functions from the pattern collection. And what that allows you to do is, if you, uh, for instance, say, um, you know, tell me the infinitive of. Actually, let me not do that one. That was conjugate. Let me just do the very simple one. Tell me the singular of cat. Cats. Cats, right? Tell me the singular of cats. Sorry, is this quite small, is it? That's okay. It says print singularize got posts and you get got that. Or you got that. Mm -hmm. Got that. Yeah. Sorry, it's behaving a bit oddly with the, yeah, so I just have to keep it at that. <coughs> and you get got that. The point is the pattern knows an awful lot about the grammatical structure of things. And so you can use these little scripts to find various things about the grammar, even in Spanish, right? Uh, there are also, by the way, uh, Dutch and German and other kinds of uh, patterns. Or you could do, um, right, so, so this is just to illustrate that um, you can use the instructions, you can get the singular and the plural, uh, maybe not terribly useful for linguistic purposes, but just to show that there's a whole series of different functions in there, you can and get... It, it knowing this kind of knowledge could mean, for instance, you would say, I want a, a sentence in which the subject is either cat or cats, I don't care, because it knows the relationship between them. Right? You, you don't have to search for particular sentences or for particular strings. You so, can have an abstract idea of what you're searching for, and pattern will know what that means. So the libraries that have grammatical, syntactical knowledge built in. So for instance, they know about verbs. So you can say, uh, tell me the um, subjunctive um, singular um, of soy. Of soy, right? Sea. That was news to me. Um, and, um, and, you know, here, here it shows you the different uh, Types, right? Uh, so maybe you can search for sentences that have this, a subject in the plural and the subjunct. Right, and, and, and you could search for a, a verb independently of the verb form, the stem form, so called, right? And you could say any verb in the subjunctive. I don't care, it, just, mm -hmm. I have, it has to be a subjunct. It has to be a subjunctive past perfect. It has to be. It has to be. But you can also search for words. In other words, for a particular word. Maybe more relevant, this is what we've used for encoding large data set in Red Hen, is we, uh, we parse, which is a, a parts of speech uh, analyzer. Uh, and um, uh, if we, the example they have here uh, is this one sentence. Uh, what this does is. El gato negro mm -hmm. se sienta en la estera. This is, this is uh, called a variable. Right? So it's some random uh, string that you use as a variable. And then you take this whole request and um, you put it into this um, variable s. Um, so basically you can paste in your sentence here. And the, but the advantage is that you can now, you saw how fast this was, right? It's, it's more or less instantaneous. And the codes um, are, um, it's, it's what's called the tree bank, the pen tree bank uh, set of codes. And you can just, you know, look them up. This is also on the click, on the click, uh, uh, click site. And uh, it has things like a you know, determiner, so on and so forth, right? in different categories. So you look up what the codes mean. And what we're able to do with the, uh, 
this grammatically encoded text is that we can look for constructions. They can contain certain keywords, and then um, they can uh, have specific grammatical syntactical properties. Now, one way um, uh, we, we've used this for the large data set of television news, um, uh, captions, teletext transcriptions, right? And um, um, let's see here. Um, Mark showed how in CQP web we can search for particular words, particular constructions. Uh, so we actually have a, an interface for that. Um, if uh, you're interested in having this also available in Spanish, we expect that we would be able to do that. This is done by uh, uh, Peter Uric in uh, Airline. Um, and uh, it's one of the ways in which the, uh, the structure of the text can be, you know, he, this is basically a concordance, right? generates a concordance of the word time uh, very rapidly. So you see that it gives you the, the context before and the context after. And if you clicked on any of these links, it would take you to uh, the performance of that expression by a... Uh, well, actually here... Yeah, you have... It's, 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 I think it's at the end. No. Is it this one? Is it on this side? Yeah, so the video is actually the number in the, in, on the left side. I see. So you see here, the, um, each line is numbered. Uh, by following that... Um, so I should say, as Cristobal saw, saw yesterday, his collaborator, Javier Valenzuela in Murcia, was having a video conference with us, and his team of researchers said, well, the tagging interface for the gestures would be a lot better if we could have this extra field. So that new field was in the tagging interface for the database about a half an hour later. We, we, we own this, we can change it with the help of a lot of, a lot of people. So it's not as if this is a frozen system. Collaborator wrote things. So. Last week before the trip to Washington, Terry was waiting for the bus to get Almost all that time. So the, the text he found, you can go directly to the place where the person is actually saying it and watch it as many times as you like and watch the gestures and so on. So, so what we're looking at is partly, you know, how can we systematically study human communication? Uh, one avenue into the system is this verbal analysis. We can supplement that with a syntactical analysis. There are also other tools that act directly on text. Berkeley's FrameNet project, for instance, going on for decades, uh, has encoded conceptual frames. But we've also used their work to encode our three billion words in the Red Hand dataset for conceptual frames. In addition, we're working on other modalities of. Um, let's see, maybe make this a little bit bigger. So Francis, just to provide a little example from, from what people are doing here. Yeah. So imagine I have a project on evidentiality, like, you know, so here is... A project on? Evidentiality. Evidentiality. That's where okay. you mark something. Sure, sure. We have a world source. expert here. Lamaso has been working for that. Yeah, on that. yeah it's a great topic. For ages. So he wants to look at prosody, marking uh, yeah. certain yeah. Uh, degrees of or expression related to evidentiality. Yeah. Uh, he can search for grammatical and syntactic patterns, abstract ones that he thinks are conveying these meanings or, or that are interesting for him, yeah. and pretty much immediately get all these hits from the news where the people are saying that, and then tag them Right. Perfect segue, because our summer Google of Code is about audio detection, including prosody. Go, 
right? So, so, so what we're working on this summer, you know, so basically last summer we did lots of work on text. Uh, this summer we uh, are working with uh, Google Summer of Code with uh, a bunch of students from all over the world on various aspects of automated audio parsing. So of course, uh, uh, much of the um, communicative power, in fact, uh, evidentiary information is a very interesting one because that may be conveyed by tone of voice rather than by um, uh, the, the, the visual uh, uh, words used. Right? So um, we're looking at uh, paired linguistic markers. Um, we're looking at emotions. <coughs> We're looking at um, uh, speaker diarization, is uh, identifying who is speaking, when, identifying the speakers. Um, so there's a whole, a whole series of projects here that will generate metadata that will allow us to systematically go through these very large corpora uh, and systematically uh, correlate certain textual expression, certain um, auditory signals. And finally, um, we've, we've just started working with um, a group in, in Basel. You're shifting to image now. You're shifting to visual search. That's right. So um, we're also, we, we've been working on visual search for a long time. I mean, visual interpretation in, in general. But this group, what they're doing is, they're saying, sketch an image of what you're looking for, roughly. Say a sky. Say a uh, tree on the side here, you see he's picking colors um, with a branch, and, uh, and there's something sitting on that branch, a bird, kind of. Uh, look through hundreds of hours of the. You don't need to be gassed in the show. <laughs> right? And, and they even added motion. So they say, you know, the bird kind of moves off the branch in that direction. Look for that. So they say, you know, well, we found something, you know, it's the tree and the branch, but where's the and bird? Then you get intermediate results, but we said, no, we actually want the bird, right? Want the bird, and uh, and 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 uh, you know, this <laughs> candidate, right? And there's nothing special about cartoons. It could be images. It could be pictures of the sculptures of faces you know, in Beisle. It could be full cultural heritage. It could be Russian icons. Yeah. And let me, on evidentials and video, I'm going to steal this for just a second, Francis, because I have a little project in evidentials. And um, as you know, in English, uh, we do not do morphological marking for evidentials. There are languages in which if it's reportedly or allegedly or something like that, you morphologically mark the verb. In English, we have these lexical evidentials and they're, they're very weak. But it might be that there are some pretty powerful visual indications of evidentials because, of course, people everywhere always do whatever they can. Now, it happens that in the news, uh, they frequently talk about the future. And in particular, they talk about weather. Everybody wants to know about weather. And so one of the things you can talk, do is talk about possible futures. So this is where the hurricane Irene is coming in. But one of the things that they do in weather reports is talk about not only the possible futures, but how confident they are of what's going to happen. So, if you look at this image of Irene's path, you'll notice that they say, well, here's the early week and there's the late week. So they're already compressing time to one place. That's a very interesting thing. But they're giving you different possibilities, right? Different possibilities. Now, I so went... So just to clarify, right? Here, right? But this doesn't mean that... The that the storm will become wider and wider and, and, and cover all no, of the storm. And in fact, it won't. When it hits land, it will become smaller. But you really care if you're in Florida or in the, in the, the eastern seaboard of the United States, is it going to go up into the Gulf? Or is it going to ride up the Atlantic? You particularly care about this if you're in South Carolina, 
right? So which one, which one will it be? Well, I went looking for some of these evidentials that are marked linguistically in lexical items in English, and I said, and I want it to be marked by frame net for weather. I want it to be marked by the frame for likelihood. That didn't mean they had to use the word likelihood, because frame net knows about conceptual domains. It knows about possibility and likelihood. And some other combinations of things in the search. And I get things like this. Notice it says tropical storm, Irene, strengthening, which is about a future. And then he says, it likely is going to be somewhere close to South Florida by the end of this week, perhaps Thursday or Friday. So notice he says it is likely, so that's a good... Uh, and he has a good positive on likely. And on the screen, remember, we can parse what's on the screen. It says threat. And there are some other things on here that I mark. Now here's, here comes the evidential, the visual evidential. Because this little round thing is the hurricane. That's not the size of the hurricane. That's the most likely path. But this widening cone over time, and notice it's labeled with times. This is not a measure, and everybody understands this, this is not a measure of the size of the hurricane. The width of the cone is a measure of our ignorance. The wider the cone, the more ignorant we are, the less certain we are about where it will be placed. So exactly, I think, because English is so weak in evidentials, I could think, where are they going to be talking about evidentials in the future? It's going to be weather reports. Weather reports are all over the world, everywhere. Here, get me some linguistic evidentials. I'm going to go look for the visual evidentials. And here they are. And if I ever get the time to do it, I'm going to publish an article on graphical evidentials in the weather in, in English. So here's an example. And I, and I would like to impress upon you, if we come up with this topic right here, I could have found these examples in 30 seconds from Los Angeles. This goes back to the beginning when I was talking about my students. The hardest thing of work, really, in working multi in multimodal communication is getting good data, ecologically valid data. So what we've all done, what I did in my youth, is one, you know, you get some text, and two, there's very little text, so you listen to what your friends say, and you write it down, and then they think, oh, you think I'm so interesting, and my wife will explain to them, no, no. He just wants to know, he's just interested in the way you said it, which would be very disappointing to people. In, in junior, in graduate school, one of my friends said, Mark, did anyone ever tell you that you f treat your friends like data? So you have, to, you have to be careful about that. But the other thing you do is you make it up. You say, well, if I wanted to say this, I would say blah, blah, and that's called introspection. Or could I say this? And you ask yourself how you feel about this grammatical the grammaticality, that's a grammaticality judgment, but many, many linguists have shown that we're largely deluded about uh, grammaticality judgments, what we couldn't say and what we couldn't say, that in fact professional syntacticians are much worse at judging what gets said in the community than normal people. And we, we don't really believe that. We will never give up introspection and adventitious encounter with the data, but what we want is a big data where we can test our hypotheses. And it doesn't depend on us, and it's not experimenter effects, and it's not ecologically invalid. This doesn't replace any other way of doing it, but it's a new and bigger way of doing it. I give you back this. So the, the larger project that we're involved in here, and that we're inviting you to join us in, is building resources at three levels. So one is, um, one is uh, Corpora. Uh, we've just met with the uh, IT uh, team here at uh, the University of Navarra and uh, have a tentative agreement to set up a capture station so that we can have uh, 20 television stations captured here at the University of Navarra. Begin to develop a local data set that might be maybe Spanish, maybe Basque, maybe French, uh, whatever is available. Uh, and, of course, that will then be added together with the Red Hand data set 
Let's hope Spanish is still available in the future. Sorry. Let's hope Spanish will still be available in the future. Y por qué no, muchachos? There's many stairs. That's what I asked myself. Yeah, and uh, so, so, so there'll be, uh, you know, various uh, data sets uh, collected uh, from all over the world. I shouldn't just put uh, UCLA here, but, uh, but the, the Red Hen um, data set, which is collected uh, from uh, multiple countries. And um, um, in addition to these news data sets, the tools that we've been developing and that we've been showing you aren't really limited to operating on television news. They can also be used on literary texts, as in your example. They can be used for uh, large collections of uh, paintings. Uh, so we're reaching out now to, um, in, in, we just had a Skype conversation with the uh, contact in Rome to see if we could connect with the Vatican's uh, large digital collections. Of, of art, Sorry. and um, uh, so, so collecting corpora is one area of collaboration, and the second area is um, um, uh, what we could call um, um, computational expertise or tools, right? So let's just call them uh, computational tools. Um, and uh, uh, we've looked at this, right, that this is uh, uh, text, uh, audio tools, um, and um, image tools. The field here is called computer vision. And um, these, these two, our group is largely not focused on developing these tools ourselves. There are large communities, large ecosystems of, within the universities that uh, work on developing tools in these, of these different types. And this is a cutting edge research in computer science departments, statistics, and so on. So we, we work with them. We already have lots of contacts. And then at the third level, um, we want to develop expertise. And the, the expertise is a combination of the research that we're already doing, humanities, questions, discourse issues, linguistics issues, media, social science issues, right? And if we take something like um, um, Evidentiary uh, uh, um, uh, ways of, ex of expressing evidentiary uh, qualifications. To put it that way, right? uh, the way we would, the, the way the uh, these computational tools work is um, for a subset of patterns. It, it's ready made. So, for instance, for syntax, uh, this has already been solved. But let's say for evidentiary, let's say that it's not been solved. Let's say that Mark's example of these cones that are used in weather forecasts have never been studied. Nobody's written the tools to, to identify them. The procedure for developing one of these tools is um, basically that um, we start out with manual coding. Uh, of a kind that we uh, already are doing, to put it that way, right? And then um, we use what is called machine learning on manually decoded data sets. What that means is that you annotate a tag, uh, a particular set of uh, videos, let's say, that, you know, this is what this is what we're looking for, this particular feature, whatever evidentiary feature you're looking for. You go in and you tag it down and you do 100, 200 of them, right? And then you train a machine. <clears throat> There's a whole uh, you know, discipline called machine learning. It's actually a big growing uh, field right now. Uh, and you, you train 
your um, machine learning program to recognize patterns within the data that you have manually determined is what you're looking for. Right? And then once you have that, you can then apply the pattern uh, to uh, the whole corpus. This would have taken you maybe thousands of hours, depending on the size of the corpus. And it's this procedure that allows humanists <coughs> and social scientists, linguists, to work with big data. You take the techniques you already know, you add machine learning, and it makes you, puts you in a position to work with really large data sets. And the advantage of that is, of course, that there are many types of features that don't show up in tiny data sets. Um, uh, whatever aspect of the evidentiary expressions you're interested in, for instance, you're going to you know, stumble across some of them. Right? But if you could work with a very large data set, your findings would be more interesting, more representative, more attributed facts, more varied, richer. Uh, but you couldn't do it on your own because life is limited. Right? Mm. Uh, so, um, ours longer, we to pray with. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, on the one hand, we have this opportunity to work with the emerging fact of very large data sets that we can collect relatively easily from social information from, from television, which is a very easy one. That's why we started doing that on a big scale. But there are, of course, other uh, data sets that already exist, and uh, uh, additional types that we can create. In Twitter, for instance, we can harvest Twitter feeds, we can harvest from online newspapers, so on. Right? And we can develop these tools that allow us to um, uh, find the patterns that we're looking for, customized tools, in a large corpus. Now, this is partly um, um, expertise. Uh, let me add one more thing here that um, um, so um, what, what I mean by expertise is partly just, you know, just understanding what we can do. Like familiarity with the power of these things. <coughs> The ability to take the tools that have been developed by specialists in computer science who often don't have a clue about sort of like, like Mark and I had a Skype conversation with a team in Basel that developed the sketch-based visual search system we just showed you. And they didn't quite know what to do with it. Right? That may sound incredible to you, right? Because I'm sure you have lots of things that you could do with a system like that. But they sort of didn't help, you know? They just built the system. Um, uh, people who actually study culture, who study discourse, study human communication, right? They have, we have research questions that these teams are often very interested in. Um, about five years ago, uh, my team at UCLA started working with the computer vision team. Um, all of their work was with surveillance video. Now, surveillance video is a video taken of people, you know, ATM stations, traffic, uh, pedestrians walking around, so on. Um, all of computer vision was focused on the literal interpretation of what was going on. So, for instance, you could say, here people are sitting, there's someone talking, right? Or even more, this is a gas station. That is a tree. Right. Here's somebody walking through the park. So but no right. communication. Very no intentionality. Yeah. Yeah. So there's no... And, and, and we said, look, you know, what's really happening in the world is that vision, you know, visual representations are used communicationally. They're used intentionally in order to create certain impressions, in order to, to persuade, in order to tell stories. Right? And they said, oh, really? I never thought of that. Right? So it completely changed what they did. So this may sound like, you know, very uh, uh, sort of, you may be incredulous that, that people could be so narrow-minded in a sense, but they're, they're in their disciplines, they get very used to thinking about things from a certain technical perspective. And they lose track of the fact that, you know, human phenomenon. 
So we can come to these groups and we can bring our research questions, right? And we can work with them to develop. This process is basically how to develop a classifier. This is the, what comes out of this ability to find a particular pattern uh, that's called a classifier. So if I could give you an example that's not theoretic or hypothetical, but it's happening right now. One of the things that the group in Basel, and we just learned this by having a video conference with them when we were in Madrid a few days ago. It was on Skype. They turned around the computer and showed us. One of the classifiers they have is for pointing. And it's really quite sophisticated that you could sketch somebody pointing and they could find in a data set people pointing. But they don't have anything to do with it. But if you look at the history of representations of St. John the Baptist, he's constantly doing things like looking, looking out at the painting to engage your attention. This is classic joint attention. What human beings do that no other species does routinely is try to get someone's attention and direct it. I glance here, you glance there, and then we glance back to check what we're doing. So St. John the Baptist is looking out of the painting, pointing at Christ. Later on, he's pointing to a lamb, or in the Da Vinci, there's no indication of Christian iconography, but he's pointing up like this, and you can't resist interpreting this as classic joint attention trying to direct you to something. So you have the Basel group that knows how to pick out pointing, and we have in the history of Christian art and, and for Annunciations in Marian art, the angel, the Angelus, the angel of the Annunciation, Gabriel is showing up. That's a scene of classic joint attention. Our eyes are usually just, just <laughs> slipping over there. <laughs> What's going on here? Um, they can detect these things, but they are not. They don't think of connecting it to a vast tradition of cultural heritage. So the. The distinction we're used to between technical-minded programming and the representation of traditions of meaning and cultural heritage is uh, something for a concepts museum in research, by which I mean that should just fade. We quote, it, you know, the, uh, the, the people who do classifiers for detecting image need art history more than art history needs. <laughs> the detectors, but they, but they both need each other, and we have trainings in both of these kinds of things, and we're looking for people who can stitch together synergetically any part of this. Um, so, um, oh, that's a good one. Uh, so we do want to show you one tool that we've developed for manual tagging of videos uh, along the different dimensions, and what, what we're studying here is in part how do you do effective communication? How do, you, how do you get the audience's interest? What are the various tools that are used to uh, capture your attention, to hold it, to make the story that they're telling comprehensible and intelligible? And, um, and the larger social drama here is also that this is itself, in, the media, in, right, is um, in, in rapid development, in a highly contested field. As the U.S. is losing an information war to foreign media outlets, including RT, this week the Secretary of State asked Congress for more cash to step up America's efforts to get its message, message across that he's got to shoot out report from Washington. War declared. The U.S. is now officially in an information battle with foreign media, which provide alternative views on world news. Views which often run in contrast to the coverage of events by the U.S. mainstream media. We are in an information war, and we are losing that war. I'll be very blunt in my assessment. Al Jazeera is winning. The Chinese have opened up a global English language and multi-language television network. The Russians have opened up an English language network. I've seen it in a few countries, and it's quite uh, instructive. We are coming back. The uh, BBC is coming back. Some five years ago, Western media outlets, including BBC and CNN, had a near monopoly in the coverage of world news. Things have, so things I, have I should say, 
the slowness of this is just because Francis is streaming this live at UCLA, but you can run it locally and it's very, very fluid. And of course, the kind of things that he's going to talk about is that she does things like saying the Russians have opened English, the Chinese have it. Very impressive. I have seen it. You watch her eyes, she blinks, she directs your gaze, and she says, uh, we are cutting back, the BBC is cutting back, so these sorts of gestures, which are extremely elaborate, can be reviewed again and again and again and compared with other people and annotated in a way that uh, Francis has a tool for. So, so what we're seeing here is we can as well define the different dimensions that we want to include in the analysis. So different parts of the body, uh, we could include tone of voice, so on and so forth. And uh, we can create quite complex annotations, and a lot happens. I mean, one of the very gratifying things in looking at these uh, news presentations is how richly communicative they are, how diverse and multidimensional they are. And uh, this can then be exported uh, as a normal, like a comma-separated values file, and uh, uh, used for machine learning. And of course, Francis, there is this new verb that we have come up with this week, which is called recognize. <laughs> so we have this vast set of, of television news, but there is practically nothing that we could not recognize. Right. So I could have spectacular collection of movies, you know, and uh, I now might they might even have their subtitles, so I could do exactly the same thing. Of course, I couldn't offer it uh, to the public domain or I couldn't lend it to users right. because I don't own the copyright, but I could analyze it and maybe search for, for patterns. I could parse it syntactically and search whatever I want in the subtitles and then see, look for acting patterns. Uh, Some people will be interested in the news because it's news. But a lot of people will be interested in the news for other reasons. So gesture scholars don't particularly care that it's the news, except that anchors tend not to use their hands in the United States. So the gestures <coughs> float into their heads. And they say, well, previously, right? Because they can't resist. Uh, they might be interested in it because we have uh, recordings from a day ago, two, two days ago. So you can see language evolving at the rate of E. coli very, very, very quickly. But for other kinds of purposes, there's nothing special about the news. The tools can be applied to anything for which they can actually be applied. We choose this because we're covered by copyright for doing it and because the closed captions are already provide by, provided by the broadcasters. And in some cases, we have a transcript. So CNN, at immense cost, I don't really understand it, provides transcripts on their website. So we have not only the audiovisual, but all the, so the closed caption and the transcripts professionally prepared and the on-screen text and the tagging and so on. And the big trick actually is that the timestamp, the very close timestamp in the audiovisual file, is inherited by each of these files. So whenever you find anything you want in any of them, it can tell you everything else that was on the screen at the at the same time. So it's a it's an easy way to begin to develop tools that can often be deployed to content domains very far from the broadcast news. So what would we have on Blackboard? Of course everything is important. But, you know, the expertise and the computational tools is what we're we'll be here for. That's that's what we want to develop. And then you can create a vast variety of different corporate depending on what you're interested in. The possibilities are are endless. The most important thing is that you develop the tools to be able to parse them, search them, and annotate them in the ways that research is. So, um, um, these, these tools open up new possibilities for uh, humanities and social science research, and they require coalitions, uh, collaborating institutions uh, across the usual boundaries. 
uh, and um, they require the development of uh, capacities that often aren't present within uh, humanistic institutions. So I've, I've listed uh, some here, in other words, um, develop the corpora, develop the expertise, develop the supporting computational infrastructure for it. And uh, what, we're, uh, what we're aiming for is basically to pull together a group of institutions in the, uh, in, in all over Europe, uh, and possibly outside, uh, for one of these uh, Horizon 2020 grants. Our tentative uh, title is um, uh, Cognitive Creativity and Technological Innovation. So we're specifically interested in using these tools to see patterns in the communicative flow, and then to examine innovations on top of these patterns. Right? So we've talked about the mind-brain group, and uh, this, this argument that um, habit is a precondition for creativity. Right? But they're, not, they're not in opposition, but they have this interesting dynamic enabling relationship. And um, um, the, um, the study of communication also has a production aspect. So in other words, we can look at it from the point of view of you know, what's already been done, what's, uh, uh, what, uh, what works, uh, what are the techniques of uh, diachronic studies of communication are actually quite interesting. Uh, 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 for instance, uh, television anchors uh, developed uh, uh, out of, without any care precedent, in a sense. Right? That if you read a newspaper, you don't have someone, you don't have an editor, you know, in every article sort of telling you uh, what they think and uh, giving it their spin. Um, there's just different uh, journalists just telling you what happened. Right? Uh, but relatively quickly, what became apparent in television news is that you actually, people actually really like to have an anchor. Not just an announcer who was anonymous and, and uh, uh, invisible, but an actual person and the same person. The very interesting phenomena uh, relating to the creation of trust over time, where um, Cronkite, one of the anchormen uh, in the US was on the cover of Time Magazine as the most trusted man in America. Right. So uh, um, there's, uh, there's the presentation of, um, I mean, there's a study of how this is done, but there's also a possible production angle to it. So one of the things that we're interested in as universities is developing better online tools for learning. <clears throat> a number of universities, and, and uh, we spoke with the uh, Compatron uh, Naval this, this afternoon, uh, so it appears uh, uh, the Department of Education and Psychology may also be interested in developing online courses. Now, one of the striking things about online courses is that uh, uh, they um, uh, tend to uh, uh, simply record a lecture, right? and um, uh, Sebastian Thrun famously taught robotics at Stanford, uh, opened up his course to the, to the whole world, had thousands of students, and realized, look, what am I doing? Uh, teaching a few uh, you know, spoiled children here at Stanford, why don't I instead uh, open up, the, you know, teach courses to, to tens of thousands of people to quit. He started a course at Udacity, and uh, he uh, 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 opened up uh, instruction to these uh, you know, huge numbers, uh, and found, to his dismay, that 96% on average of students in these MOOC courses, as we discussed this afternoon, uh, tended to, you know, would, would drop up on average. 4% completed. Uh, so this is a gigantic failure. He concluded that look, we have a lousy product. Right? And he, he actually basically quit the attempt that he'd set out to do, that he'd been so inspired to do. And as discourse um, uh, researchers, we might be able to make a, co a contribution to understanding why, uh, their, why, the, why the traditional book approach fails. And further, if you stretch that further back in time, so you could look at you know, the development of the anchor role, the development of a whole series of techniques for making the anchor increasingly um, uh, expressive, intimate, uh, uh, and uh, uh, 
involved in one of these multiple dimensions of, of communication. We could go back to the Renaissance, the Middle Ages, what, what kinds of techniques have been used for effective communication to the ages. So this is what we're thinking in Horizon 2020. We have a strong diachronic angle, uh, have data sets that span the present time and the past, uh, develop computational tools that can handle this range of uh, uh, corpora, uh, and uh, develop uh, expertise specifically in these areas, and, and create the infrastructure for it. Some of this needs to be in place you know, early on early in the application. Yeah. Some of it can be funded by the, uh, by the grant money. And, and just since some of what we've been saying may sound technical, I'd like to say that uh, we like human engagement mm -hmm. and we have a kind of staircase of gentle introduction to using the tools of Red Hand. Mm -hmm. So for example, an early step on the stairway is you just go to the UCLA edge search engine. And I went in just now and said, uh, I want to look up Real Madrid and I would like it to be just for the last month, just the last few days, and only in uh, 24 horas and La Una. And so it calls them up immediately. And if you take something like this one, notice, I mean, there are many meanings of Real Madrid, but all of these are links to the kinds of text and uh, other aspects, other features that would go with this broadcast. So you could look at the tagging, and you could look at the on-screen text, and you could look at the natural language processing, and you could look at the metadata, and these things, you know, they look like this. So for this show, this is what the show is, and what the captions are, and here's the text, and the uh, times, and you could just search for something in this, and when you found something, uh, you know, you could play it, and uh, this is linked to the video, so this is right at the beginning of the show, uh, uh, the newscast from uh, 24 hours, and if I click here... See, when you mouse over the thumbnail here, you get the time. It tells you the time when this... So this mention of Real Madrid was 9 minutes, uh, 9 hours, 2 minutes, 42 seconds, 9... 9.02.42 p.m. And this one was at 9.44.39. And you can play it and see it and you can play it as many times as you want. And this is very, a very easy kind of introduction to what's in the database. But of course, if you want to do more interesting things, like what was the on-screen text for this one, uh, you can look at it and you can begin to explore. And when you want a little more functionality than that, you can move to CQP Web, and doing a little regular expression searching. So these are the kinds of things that were on the screen. Accidente del Airebus. Airebus, yeah. So yeah, there, Airbus. There, there are typos in this, right? The, this is done through optical character recognition, so there are mistakes, right? Consejo General del Poder Judicial, right? And the text boxes are really useful because they tell you just what it's about. You know, they tell you Hillary Clinton goes to Spain or goes to <coughs> Catalonia, and you know that's going to be in a text box, so you can get the theme there. And but you have the timestamps, and so that will connect you back to anything else. I just want to mean that it's not uh, when people come into this. Well, for example, Cristobal and Javier, in order to do their work on time gestures, they just use this and exported it and put it into an Excel spreadsheet and all things. That's, that's, that's just true. where, and they're going to get to a publication in the American Journal of Psycho Metrics. That's the, what, whatever. Yeah. I mean, they're going to get a pub, and they, that was just out of this. Now, there are many much more sophisticated techniques and we're developing more, but we do have in, many entry-level uh, abilities to it. And typically what happens is Either you have a student who already knows everything and you just put them into the command line, or they don't know anything and they just walk themselves up in the space of a few weeks and the more motivated they are, uh, you know, they get some results, 
And then they say, but it would be better if I could get this. And you say, okay, but you're going to have to learn CQP web. And they, and they say, well, but it really needs to be this. Okay, you're going to have to learn a little regular expression and use the PEC command line. That's, uh, that's sort of the rhythm. The, the principle we use in collaborating with ins different institutions is that everyone, every partner, contributes something to the central system so that we all stand on each other's shoulders and benefit from each other's work. As a collaborative. We so have money for research, we don't have money for service. We, we, we have, everybody helps everybody out. Little red hen. Little red hen. <laughs> yeah. So this, this is the edge search engine. And in fact, one of the places we get people to go to first is the help page, which sounds like not much, but in fact there are long discussions of how you can search and what you can find and how you arrange here are all the networks we use, although that's extremely dated by now. And here's how you can display things, and here are visualizations you can ask This, this is one thing we actually do quite a bit of work on, uh, visualization of data. Yeah. That's, that's an important research area that we haven't talked about, is once you get these things, how do you do statistical analysis, and how do you make a visual graphic or representation of the statistical pattern? Um, the statistical techniques we use come almost entirely from the statistical software package R, and we work with some of the best people in the world on that. Uh, we haven't talked about that much. And, you know, you can do regular expressions. There's also a visual search that's in place that we haven't showed you at all because we mentioned the bird jumping off the uh, branch, but there is another one that's uh, available and, uh, and on and on and on. This is all on just on the help page for how to use the edge search engine. Uh, and this is, of course, we didn't do this. Largely what we do is we have students who want to do something and they say, oh, go try this, and go try it, and we say, okay, now put that on the help page, right? So we crowdsource even the help, and I should say, for example, if you just type in Red Hen Lab, uh, which I'll do right here, and go to Google, you will find lots and lots, well, in, in Red Hen Lab, you will find um, Lots of pages explaining lots of things. And uh, window red hen, yeah, like this one. Uh, if you go to the red hen lab, we have lots of tutorials, and these tutorials have largely been put together by our students. So, for instance, I had a student who wanted to le learn how to do statistical analysis in R on language. And luckily, there's a brilliant book by a man named Harold Byron on using R, statistical analysis, on linguistic data. And I said, well, I'm not teaching that, but you could do an independent study. It would be largely self-directed. And you'll do a project, but what I will require you to do, if I'm going to do this with you, is you have to create a syllabus so that anybody else who wants to learn R or linguistic analysis could follow it, and uh, you could just, uh, and it would include links for how to learn R, and I want a weekly report of everything you learn, and you will make a Google Doc. So that is open to the world, so the whole world can see. This is done by Ashley Danis, and I'm the supervisor, and here is her week of work, and what you do, and things like that. So I didn't do any of this. I told her, read the links and read Harold Byam and pick out, every week I want you to do some kind of work at Red Hen and show people how to do work in Red Hen. And she did, and she put it up, and she, uh, she's published some of that work, but all of this is here on, you know, how to make a, week 12, how to make a bar chart. Week 13, how to do scatter plots in R. She didn't know any of this before. So when I say that we're a collaborative, and we're, relying on the participants in Red Hen in order to build the tools for Red Hen, that's, that's just what I mean. So, do you guys think we could 
open a space here for questions and see, because these people are so polite that despite the fact that I told them that they could interrupt, they won't. You are in charge. Is questions. that why you make a tertulia? Is that the tradition yeah, of the tertulia? Etc. Et yes. In fact, I'm going to point this camera at them. <coughs> but actually, you might feel better if I, I weren't recording you. So, um, it's been a pleasure. Adios. Uh, that's all, folks. <laughs>